Okay, uh, I'd like to get started and welcome everyone to the second webinar in the Converge to Transform uh, series that the ASRC is hosting um, as a culminating event for its uh, five year anniversary this year. Our first event a couple of weeks ago uh, focused on the newest emerging issue that requires interdisciplinary scientific discovery to address, uh, which of course is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, today, we're gonna focus on another issue that is a longstanding issue, um, making energy sustainable. And these two things are not mutually exclusive, which is I think something that you'll hear uh, in the talks today as well. So uh, before we get going, I just wanted to give you a few reminders, a few notes on the webinar. We are recording the session and we'll be posting it online. Uh, please keep your microphone muted during the session. Uh, the chat box is currently disabled, but we're going to open it up after this after the speakers and do a, a Q and A for everyone at the end. And then after the Q and A, we're going to have breakout sessions where you can join uh, one of the speakers in a smaller group for a, a more in depth discussion. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's here with us today. First of all, today's speakers. Uh, we're really looking forward to your talks and learning about your work. Um, participants who are joining us on the webinar today from over 15 different CUNY schools as well as outside of CUNY. Um, the staff at the ASRC and the Graduate Center who have made this happen. Uh, without them, we, we would not be able to hear this, the amazing work we're going to hear about today. Uh, Camille Santa Stephen, Sean Rea, uh, Erica Klein as in Halter. Um, there's also a, a number of other staff that I don't have time to thank, but who are also very essential to this. And of course, the sponsors for our event series. Uh, as a just very brief, uh, briefly, I wanted to let everyone know that the ASRC has released its latest strategic plan, which is mapping out what we're going to be doing for the next five years. Um, to try and uh, address our vision and mission. It's broken up into these five different goal areas, disciplinary research and interdisciplinary research, integrating our efforts across all of CUNY and beyond in the city and even globally, and of course, financial resiliency. And what I wanna point out is these are not in a numerical order of importance. These are all equally important goals uh, we cannot be successful unless we really pursue all of them together at once um, and do that in partnership with all of you throughout CUNY. Um, our vision, uh, which is supported by these five goals, is to improve human, societal, and environmental well-being through interdisciplinary scientific, scientific discovery and education. And in order to be successful in this, uh, we're, we want to bring together um, as many scientists as we can from across as many disciplines as possible to address those issues that are most important to our humanity and to our society. Um, and we want to do that um, at the same time by nurturing a diverse and inclusive research culture. And I think in hosting events like this, we're meeting our goals. One of the other ways that I think we bring together interdisciplinary scientists that's really important is through our core facilities. Uh, and I never, let, I never missed an opportunity to call out um, how many uh, amazing uh, opportunities there are to do advanced research um, at the ASRC. And we welcome everyone who has been uh, or want, wants to be um, involved in doing research with us uh, to come and use our core facilities as soon as New York City lets us open them up again to your use. Um, and just to go over really quickly the, the series in general, um, we brought this together because we wanted to highlight a few areas that we think CUNY is excellent in and that we can only become more excellent in if we work together across schools and across disciplines. Um, we have our session today on uh, sustainable energy. On June 9th, we're going to be talking about environmental impacts um, on especially in urban areas that impact uh, species across multiple kingdoms. Um, and then on June 23rd, we'll be doing a session called Hacking Biology to Advance Medicine, how we can basically take advantage of biological systems in order to create therapeutics and treatments. That day, we're also going to be having a, a Twitter poster session so students and postdocs can share their research um, very broadly. And we're going to be awarding six iPads to the best posters. Uh, and then after the webinar is done, we're going to be releasing a final report. Uh, where we talk about the things that we learned, um, resources that we need in order 
to help advance interdisciplinary research at CUNY. And with that, I'm going to uh, pass this over to uh, Professor Charles Boris Marty, who is the director of the ASRC's Environmental Sciences Initiative, also professor of civil engineering at the City College of New York. Charlie. Uh, thank you, Nina. Um, so it's my great pleasure today, um, and I might actually say honor, to be introducing our keynote speaker. His name is Cutler Cleveland, and he's the associate director of the Institute for Sustainable Energy at Boston University. And as uh, I think everyone on the uh, call, uh, Zoom meeting now knows, you know, ASRC is very much dedicated to interdisciplinarity. And our mission statement is really uh, fundamentally aimed at understanding and solving society's great uh, 21st century challenges, some of which of course involve environmental issues. Um, I would probably have a nice debate with Cutler whether uh, water, which is the domain of my interest, or energy might be the key ingredient to 21st century sustainability. Yet. But rather than get into that debate here, in both cases, uh, both materials and energy are absolutely essential to life on the planet and absolutely essential to the evolution of society through this 21st century. Uh, I've known Cutler, I suppose, dating back to the late uh, 1970s, if not early 80s. Uh, and we shared um, a distinction. Uh, some might call it a misfortune. Some might call it a great blessing of having had the same advisor when we were both at Cornell University. His name was Charlie Hall. Uh, who was a pioneer in e e uh, merging perspectives from ecology, energy, and economics into a synthetic whole. And uh, Charlie made, was a bit of a crazy guy, but he did make quite a name for himself in terms of this interdisciplinary thinking. He always told us to think in this manner. I think Cutler is an ex a perfect example of following that advice. Uh, if you look at his resume, you'll see that he has a very interesting uh, background, uh, trained in biology, trained in marine science, also trained in, in geography. And his research has spanned many different domains. Uh, probably his, his best known work, I would say, is looking at something called the energy return on investments, investments of energy, uh, at a variety of, uh, for a variety of, of different energy uh, production systems. Uh, he's also looked at the carbon neutrality of cities. He's, he's also uh, analyzed crazy things like uh, uh, pest control uh, ecosystem payments using bats in, uh, in Texas. Um, he's also uh, been author or co-author or editor on three major reference works related to energy. He wrote an encyclopedia of energy. He has a dictionary of energy uh, and a handbook of energy. And rumor has it uh, that you're also working right now on a cookbook of energy, and I'm, I'm waiting for the chapter on nuclear casseroles, uh, uh, Cutler. I hope you give me a signed copy of that, of that next book. Uh, so in, in some sense, he's a one-man uh, interdisciplinary research center. His talk today is going to uh, be on COVID, climate change, and the clean energy transition. He's going to try to pull these things together, and he's going to cast his, um, his uh, comments, I believe, at, at a macro scale or strategic uh, scale. And we've packaged up his talk along with uh, talks that, that really are uh, fundamental underpinnings of some of these larger scale issues that he's going to talk about. So even though he's talking about a, an energy transition at a very strategic level, uh, in order to make that happen, we need to have research done uh, on batteries at, at a much different spatial and temporal scale. We need to understand nanoscale fluorescence, and we need to understand quantum dots. And we're going to be featuring after his talk uh, some excellent uh, distinguished researchers uh, drawn from the, the CUNY campuses to talk about how these, these other kinds of, uh, let's say, more the bench scale type analysis really feeds into these big strategic issues. And it's very exciting. In some sense, it's a microcosm of what we try to do at the ASRC, try to talk across disciplines and we try to talk across scales right down to the nano level. So at this point, I'd like to uh, turn over the podium, the electronic podium to Cutler and uh, thanks for joining us today, Cutler. Thanks so much, Charlie, uh, for that great, uh, great introduction. 
Yeah, the uh, energy water debate would be a good one because uh, they're pretty much, uh, along with food, uh, the core of the sustainability challenge. And that's why there's so much research at the nexus of those uh, three things. Regarding the cookbook, I've already taken notes and I'm gonna have to fire off a prospectus uh, pretty quickly to beat you, uh, beat you to the punch. But thanks again for that, uh, for that introduction, and Nina uh, for you as well. In, in uh, early February, the, the two of you invited me uh, to uh, participate uh, in the center's seminar series, and I plan to talk about the clean ener energy transition and urban decarbonization, which I'm deeply involved in now, as we knew them at the time. But like every other uh, aspect of our existence, the COVID-19 pandemic has altered how we think about clean energy, climate change, and city life. The pandemic has dramatically transformed our economy in very negative ways in the short run, our health, our social lives, and uh, our emotions. And it, here in the United States, it has also laid bare stark differences in people's perception of the role of government the usefulness and credibility of science and America's place in the world order. The pandemic continues to take a, a staggering human toll, but it has also produced behavioral changes and revealed new opportunities to address climate change and other sustainability challenges. I'm gonna talk about, about some of those. So I'll begin by talking about some similarities and differences between the pandemic and climate change at a pretty high level without going into a lot of detail. And then I'll uh, dive in a bit closer and look at the clean energy transition at the national and city levels. And I'll take a deep but short dive into climate action in Boston, where I have participated in some, uh, some technical work aiding the city in its goal to be carbon neutral by, by 2050. So uh, I'll begin with a, uh, a short, uh, quiz. It's kind of a fake quiz, actually, but uh, nevertheless, uh, a, a question that is at the center of uh, the climate challenge. And that is, are we on track uh, in terms of GHG emissions and global warming for a, a 1.5 degree world? And those of you who follow the climate change uh, uh, science and literature know that 1.5 degree is a reference to uh, an, an increase in uh, temperature change relative to pre-industrial times that will keep the, Sid, the world's ecosystems that support life glued together at least at some reasonable level and avoid some of the most deleterious impacts of, of climate change. And here's what we have observed thus far. This is a graph of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions measured in gigatons of CO2 equivalent back to 1970. And you can see that they have roughly doubled. And uh, the historic uh, trend in GHG emissions uh, since the late 19th century has produced a warming of about 1.0 degrees centigrade uh, increase up until this point. So the climate models tell us that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees C, the target, uh, as early as 2030 and as late as 2052 if this current trend that you see continues. So what we need to do Sorry to interrupt, Cutler. We're not seeing your slides right now. Can you share your screen again? Oh, sorry. Sorry Thanks. about that. Is that any better? Yes. Sorry about that. So here's what I was talking about. <laughs> here's the graph with CO2 emissions on a world scale uh, doubling over this period of time. And the climate models tell us that we need to get down to uh, 20 to 5 to 30 gigatons by 2030 and uh, a net close to zero by, uh, by 2050 to reach this target. So clearly we have our work cut out for us. That is a, a gross, uh, gross understatement. So 
that's the sort of backdrop. Now some, uh, some discussion of the connection between the, the pandemic and, uh, and climate change. And there are many similarities. Uh, some I think uh, are real, some I think are a bit overblown, but here are some high level similarities that I think are important. And the first and most important, which we all, I think intuitively know, but oftentimes don't uh, express is that they're really, really scary. The, the threats are global. They are very dire in terms of the impact on human health and well-being, and they're also invisible until their effects are upon us. So this makes them very unsettling emotionally. Preparedness is critical for dealing with both of them. We have seen the very large disparity in preparedness across cities, states, and countries with COVID-19. And lack of preparedness has uh, led to uh, a lot of excess death relative to a situation where we were more prepared. And we know that climate change reaching 1.5 degrees, uh, the 1.5 degrees target will take a lot of advanced preparation in dealing with the effects of climate change, rising sea level, uh, more uh, hotter summers will also require a lot of, of preparation. The impacts of both are highly inequitable. You've all probably seen uh, in the news, the very stark differences by income, race, and ethnicity of COVID-19 fatalities. Similarly, the impacts of climate change fall along the same equity fault lines. And uh, equity is important to deal with uh, for sustainable solutions to both problems. And finally, the, the fundamentals of both are well known. And by this, I mean that science and medical research have fairly well described how pandemics work, even though they're tricky to nail down uh, individually. And similarly, the, the basics of climate change and its impacts are now pretty well established. So the challenge is how we implement that, that knowledge into action that produces real change. There obviously are some important differences between the two phenomena as well. One is speed. The pandemic, as the name itself uh, implies, is uh, really fast. It seems like eons ago that my spring semester got interrupted and we went from in-person to remote uh, teaching, but it was really only a couple of, of months ago. Um, whereas climate change, we see, ep we see uh, episodic manifestations of climate change, wildfires, flooding, and so on. But the, the impacts of climate change play out on much longer time scales. The scales also operate differently. And the, the big difference here is that the climate change is going to affect every nook and cranny of the planet, literally. Some areas will actually probably benefit, northern latitudes that may have a longer growing season. Most will, will see uh, negative impacts. And then there's differences in reversibility. You can't reverse the loss of human life, obviously, but through advances in medicine and vaccines, you can dramatically slow or perhaps even halt a virus. Ch Long-run climate change is not reversible on any time scale of interest to the human species. Once these em emissions go up in the atmosphere through the long uh, lifetime of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, changes that occur are gonna be with us for a very, very long period of time. Okay, now let's turn to uh, how we think about uh, using clean energy and other uh, instruments to reduce emissions. And our work in Boston and in other cities uh, has shown similar to research in other areas that there are four mutually reinforcing strategies to getting carbon emissions, net carbon emissions down to zero. The first is that you have to reduce the demand for energy and maximize energy efficiency. So in cities, this means that every building is a high performance building, travel shifts from single occupancy vehicles to public transit, biking and walking, and waste diversion is, is, minified, is uh, minimized. Secondly, uh, 
a carbon neutral city convert systems that currently run on fossil fuels, such as cars and furnaces and stovetops to use electricity instead. So heating systems are converted to heat pumps and electric boilers where feasible. Third, a carbon neutral city purchases electricity that is 100% GHG free. And it fully utilizes the potential for in-city renewable generation, such as uh, rooftop solar. Any renewable fuel that remains has to be sustainably sourced. And finally, equity is uh, critically important. And you know this is a very complicated issue. Um, I, I will simply uh, observe the following from you know, a, a moral social justice argument. Uh, I would contend that each person's contribution to society is valuable and that we must address barriers and historical factors that have led to unfair conditions for uh, marginalized pop populations. Now, the moral argument only has traction in certain audiences, but there are a lot of very sort of selfish reasons we should be concerned about equity. From an economic perspective, higher incomes reduce poverty that is costly to society and uh, equity enhancing policies such as investment and education produce in the long run uh, economic growth uh, and other positive economic outcomes. And equity also enhances social cohesion and reduces uh, political conflict. So getting to zero requires that you do all of this simultaneously. It's not a, what, th these aren't sequential. You have to go all at once. If all you did was uh, electrify everything, you could become carbon neutral. If everything was electric and everything was produced with wind and solar or nuclear, you would be GHG free. However, your utility bills would go through the roof. So that's why you also have to improve energy efficiency. You dampen the demand for uh, energy. And equity uh, has to be addressed because if you don't address that, it will undermine uh, progress in other areas. So, Let's, sort, let's apply that uh, on the uh, source side to a look at what energy transitions actually look like. And here's one of the most important uh, time series uh, out there that describes long run energy transitions. So the vertical axis is the percent of total electricity generation in the US that comes from different sources from 1920 to uh, 2018. And if you start back at the beginning of the series, you see that coal, the top, the top line in, in um, blue, and hydro, the next line down, were the workhorses. 90% of electricity generated came from those two sources. Then very quickly, hydro dropped in its share of, of generation, largely because the demand for electricity continued to rise, but most of the big rivers in the US had been dammed by World War II, and so there was minimal potential to uh, expand, uh, expand hydro. But coal retains a dominant share for 80 years. And it, it, the story of coal is really remarkable. If you look at the eve of the 20th century, it was generating the same share that it did in 1920. It was the real workhorse for power generation. Note also the coal has dropped off rapidly recently, and I'm gonna come back to that uh, in a moment. But one lesson uh, from this is that major energy transitions take a really long time, historically, really long time. I'm talking many, many decades for a major shift to uh, occur. This is especially true for capital intensive industries that also cultivate very powerful political constituencies, which is certainly the case for coal and uh, the other fossil fuels. Let's also turn now to uh, examine uh, the case of nuclear power. So nuclear power is down here in this lighter blue line uh, here. The first power plant came online in 1957, but it will take more than two decades for nuclear energy to break the 10% market share. So two decades. And this is another example of how major energy transitions, the penetration of a new technology takes uh, a very long period of time. The graph also shows the importance of policy and how it can affect the penetration of, of new technologies and drive transitions. So let's look at the 1970s, which is a tumultuous 
period for energy due to the rapid increases in energy prices in 1974 and again in, in through 1978 and 1980, which roiled energy markets and also the world uh, economies. So in the United States, we passed something called the Fuel Use Act in 1978. And this was meant to reduce our use of oil, particularly in power generation and to reduce our dependence on imported oil. And so the Fuel Use Act in 1978 said that you couldn't construct a new baseload power plant without uh, the capability, uh, without its capability to use coal or natural gas. It basically forbid oil from being used in power generation. And so what you can see here in 1978, you have this big boost in coal. It rapidly gains 10% market share due to the Fuel Use Policy Act. And that's important because for the following reason. If you look at this big decline that coal has experienced lately, which is a good thing from an environmental and climate perspective, think about where we would be now if it started from this point rather than this point in this, this decline. And this is uh, entirely driven by a policy decision. If we look down here at the bottom with wind and solar, we can also see some impacts of policy tax credits, state renewable portfolio standards, state greenhouse gas emission targets and other policies have helped boost solar and wind. And in Europe, feed-in tariffs and other policies have generated the fastest expansion of renewable uh, power uh, in the world. Wind and solar are also examples of another important driving force behind these transitions, and that is technological development. In the case of photovoltaics, you can see that illustrated in this graph, which shows the cost of a watt of power generated from uh, photovoltaic energy, going back to 1975. And you can see that it has dropped precipitously from more than uh, almost $80 per watt to now well less than a dollar a watt. And this is due to things such as improve, largely due to improvements in the efficiency of fuel uh, of the uh, solar cells, materials engineering advances, lower costs for inverters and other components, cheaper costs of installing them, and cheaper costs for permitting and installation costs. And the same thing has happened for wind. And the same thing has now happened for batteries, which we'll hear about uh, in, in a bit. So all this has contributed to the fact that wind, onshore wind is now cheaper, way cheaper than coal, as cheap as gas and way cheaper than nuclear power in the United States without any subsidies. And the same is happening for, uh, for solar. But what's good for the goose is also good for the gander. And in this case, this innovation has also revolutionized the fossil fuel industry. This big uptick in natural gas's share of power generation over the last 20 years has recently been uh, uh, helped by hydraulic fraction and horizontal drilling, AKA fracking, which has become now economically viable and has laid open a whole vast large uh, storage of low previously low quality gas to commercial development. And uh, that has made, made gas cheap, uh, cheaper than other sources and, and helped uh, boost its uh, share. Technological advance is also evident in the nuclear series. Notice that nuclear has retained a near constant 20% share since the late 1980s. And this is remarkable in light of the fact that no one's building nuclear power plants anymore. Mo many have been canceled, uh, yet it has retained this market share. And it, that has happened due to something known as uprating, which is increasing the amount of energy you can get per unit of fuel in nuclear power reactors. Slightly enriched fuel, better management of, of refueling plants, better management has get more power out of an existing plant. And it uh, will greatly extend the life of the nuclear power industry uh, in the US. The graphs also have embedded in them the impact of, of cultural norms. Part of the uptick in wind and so solar is clearly due to concern about climate change and the push, particularly at local and state levels for renewable energy. Nuclear power's future is uncertain. It's clean from a greenhouse gas perspective. Uh, it's very reliable, the most reliable uh, form of base load power that we have, but people have, whether you agree with it or not, have uh, 
concern about nuclear energy for a variety of reasons. Fracking and natural gas are fraught with political uh, issues. And equity issues loom large as well. Fossil fuels carry very large human health impacts, massive health impacts. The average life expectancy in Northeast China, where coal, coal power generation is concentrated, has been reduced by six years due to the inhalation of pollutants uh, from coal. So one of the questions I always ask my class is, well, what if you ran this graph out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what is it gonna look like? And going back to the current pandemic, we have seen some retrenchment in plans for new renewable energy, uh, but we also see a lot of stickiness of uh, utilities and investors desire for clean power. And so I think that is, there's a lot of momentum there that is going to, to stay. And certainly any kind of green stimulus program were it to happen, which it won't unless there's a change in administration in September, would accelerate these, uh, these changes. So now let's, let's turn from the national level to uh, a city level. And uh, I was uh, led a project here at the Institute at, at BU called Carbon Free Boston. You can see the title pages of a suite of reports we produced, which was essentially a technical analysis to help the city understand how we could get to zero emissions by 2050 in buildings, transportation, energy supply, and waste. And I wanna just show you what that actually looks like or could look like in a city. I'll pick one sector, which is buildings, where two thirds of the city's emissions come from. And this is a, a result of our modeling exercise where we, we begin uh, with 2015 as a base year and look at the current level of emissions along the uh, vertical axis from buildings and then forecast out to 2050 where they will be based on different assumptions about technology and policy. So if with sort of a business as usual scenario with current population growth and building technology and pipe policy in the pipeline, emissions will be roughly flat. We then looked at, well, what if you went in and retrofitted all 95,000 buildings with a state-of-the-art deep energy retrofits to improve efficiency? And what if you required all new buildings to be net zero? Then if you did that, you would get, you would move from here to here in 2050. You would get a, take a big bite out of emissions, but it doesn't get you close to zero, right? Zero is down here. <laughs> that's, where this, that's where the mayor said uh, he wants to be by 2050. Of course, he'll be long gone by then, but then uh, if you then take all the buildings and electrify them. So you take out all the gas and oil furnaces and boilers and you put in electric equipment, you actually have a slight increase in greenhouse gas emissions. And that's because in 2050, there is forecast with the current grid, which is 60% natural gas in New England, you will still have a lot of greenhouse gas embedded in the electricity that you buy. And it's only if you assume the grid becomes cleaner, which is this dark blue drop, that you get a big reduction. And that electrification scenario assumes that the electricity in Massachusetts follows state law, which the clean energy standard requires that all electricity sold in Massachusetts by 8050, that 80% of it has to be GHG free. And if you do that, you get this big drop. So the state will do a lot of heavy lifting for the city. Then the city would have to go out and purchase renewable energy uh, and uh, through offsets or virtual power purchase agreements to uh, reduce emissions further. And there's still some residual emissions left. There are gonna be some buildings where it's gonna be really hard to get oil or gas out. But you can get very close to uh, emissions. But this is a heroic leap from a policy perspective, not technology so much, but more from a policy perspective to get this, get this done. We also looked at in one of these reports, the issue of equity. And how do you rid a major city of fossil fuels and not make the substantial inequities that already exist worse and hopefully make it better? 
So we defined an index of social vulnerability, which is displayed here for the city of Boston. So the dark black lines are neighborhoods that are labeled there. And so if you know Boston, so here's Logan Airport over here. Uh, here's the downtown area. BU is over here along the river. MIT is kind of right here. Harvard's over here. And we created an index which measured, which combined income, race, ethnicity, uh, the presence of children in the household, the presence of elderly in the household, and the degree to which people speak English. Anyways, the darker, you can see that socially vulnerable uh, households are concentrated in certain regions, Roxbury in Dorchester, where a lot of people of color live, also up here in East Boston, uh, parts of Mission Hill, and so on. And so we looked at these various strategies and policies from the perspective of how it would impact and how they could be devised to, to strategize to uh, improve these uh, the lots of, of people who live in these areas. And so in housing, in buildings, we're faced with the following. There's a woeful lack of affordable housing in Boston and it's getting worse as incomes rise, real estate values, of course, COVID is gonna change perhaps a lot of that, but so this is pre-COVID uh, analysis. Socially vulnerable households experience high levels of energy, energy insecurity. The lowest income households pay up to 30% of their monthly income for fuel and electricity. Socially vulnerable neighborhoods have harder to retrofit buildings. They're renters and multifamily. And if you don't design it right, uh, putting in uh, retrofits and rooftops can actually increase asset value and accelerate gentrification and uh, displacement. So here's an example of that. So we took all 250,000 households in Boston and we segregated them along three filters. Is it, do the households have above or below the median income of the city? Is it renter or owner occupied? And is it single family or multifamily? And so this produced uh, 16,000 out of the 250,000 households that you see here. And the green are in the hardest to, uh, excuse me, the orange are in the harder to retrofit buildings. They're renter occupied, they are multifamily buildings, and they are lower than the average income. And the greener at the other end of the spectrum, they're the easiest. And notice that the hardest to retrofit buildings are concentrated in Roxbury, Dorchester, up here in East Boston near the airport, Mission Hill, and other areas where those socially vulnerable populations live. So you really need to design a, a decarbonization strategy which has this in mind from the outset to deal with these challenges. The COVID pandemic has revealed additional inequities that are important, it's particularly who can telecommute and what exactly is an essential occupation and who works in it. And on the left, we have from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, an estimate of who can telecommute in 2018. And you can see that uh, either by race or eth ethnicity, people of color, have significantly less opportunity to telecommute than do uh, whites and Asians. And on the right, we look at some work done uh, by folks here in the uh, ACLU in Massachusetts on uh, the percent of workers in Boston who work in what have been designated as essential occupations. And again, the darker the colors, the larger the fraction of people that work and people who have to show up for work in a pandemic. And you can see again, concentrated in Roxbury, Dorchester, East Boston. So now the pandemic aspect lays, layers on a whole new dimension to, well, it didn't layer it on, it was always there, but it's now been revealed by the, by the pandemic. So one of the things that we've been thinking about on our team here is what, what have we observed in the short run that we would like to try and keep? And one of the remarkable things, you've all seen the, these, probably some of these images, is the cleaner air. Unfortunately, the, the pandemic has shut down the uh, economy. I shouldn't laugh because it's, it's horrific what's happening, but which means less fuel use and all of a sudden the air is much cleaner. 
I saw on Twitter this picture on the left taken by uh, someone in, uh, in the a city in the Punjab province of India up in the Himalayas, and he claimed there was the first time in 30 years that he could see the Himalayas due to the drop in particulate matter in ozone. So how can we retain, people have now have a renewed sense literally of what it's like to have cleaner air. How can we build on that? On the right is uh, a street about a block away from me here in Arlington, Massachusetts, where they have adopted a, a slow streets program where you put up physical barriers and signage and you, you prohibit through traffic and you encourage multiple use of the street, including people, bikes, wheelchairs, scooters, uh, as well as cars who presumably move more slowly. Can this be retained? Oakland has uh, already made a large number of these permanent, so they, so they claim. Open space. Wow, people have really come to appreciate open space uh, in cities, which has important sustainability and climate perspective because trees sequester carbon and they provide lots of other ecological benefits such as groundwater recharge, reduced sewage uh, runoff and cooling and so on. Telecommuting. Uh, I have a feeling we're gonna see a big change in telecommuting. Here in Boston, I've talked to a couple real estate uh, developers, and they're like, hmm, uh, we have all these giant buildings which cost a bazillion dollars per square foot to rent. And now I have some of my clients who are looking and saying, well, no one's here and we're still doing okay. So do I need to be paying for all this space? Um, so telecommuting is good because it also uh, reduces greenhouse gases. However, uh, telecommuting doesn't, be careful about telecommuting. It doesn't produce as large a drop as, uh, as many people think because it has a lot of in, uh, indirect effects. So people stay home more, so you have more air conditioning and heating and cooling at home. And it also does things like uh, when you commute by car in and out of a city, you, you oftentimes daisy chain on your return trip uh, other errands. You stop at the pharmacy, you stop at the dry cleaner. When you stop doing that, you start doing more individual trips from home, which has some offsetting effects. But taken as a whole, telecommuting does reduce uh, emissions. And uh, the food has also become uh, a big issue, not just shortage of food that has uh, occurred, but also the focus on the, the uh, meat industry and it being an, an epicenter here in the U.S. for uh, the pandemic. And it has brought into focus again the issue of, of the importance of diet in climate change. And that's opening up a can of worms, which I will open and then immediately run away from. But simply state what we know from a scientific perspective, and that is eating lower on the food chain significantly reduces your carbon footprint. That's a fact. And for most Americans, the single largest action they could take is to eat lower on the food chain. So I think that the pandemic will cause, will add some fuel to that discussion that is uh, ongoing. There are also changes that we want to reverse. Uh, clearly the economic recovery is essential. We could do a lot of the, uh, stimulate a lot of green, clean energy and GHG reduction through a green economic stimulus. There are a, a million of these different plans out there which call for more energy efficiency, more electric vehicles and so on. Uh, it's not really likely to happen in any significant way in the US unless there's uh, a, uh, a change in Washington in November, which could happen. Public transportation in the cities is a big concern uh, because getting people back on buses and subways is going to be a big challenge. Even if you can uh, prove, show that you're disin disinfecting them appropriately, people are going to be afraid. And so that has lots of, that's not good from a greenhouse gas perspective because if pe more people drive, uh, then more em emissions go up. And there's also this issue of density, which is, uh, which has been, been talked a lot about you know, people, density is not the enemy in, in the pandemic. Uh, historically, back a long time ago, cities were centers for pandemics, but 
uh, through advances in public health, cities have produced enormous advances in public health and the average life expectancy in the US and a lot of other countries is higher in cities than in rural areas. Uh, so there are uh, tremendous benefits. And you know, when you look at New York City, uh, Manhattan has two to uh, eight times the density of the other boroughs in terms of population density, but it has a way lower population adjusted fatality rate. And that's because it's related more to crowding, number of people per room, rather than density per se, and uh, which is related to income and affordable housing uh, and so on. So we want to keep we're going to keep messaging the important benefits of the cities in terms of uh, greenhouse gas reduction. So uh, in, in closing, a couple of of observations. One piece of uh, small piece of anecdotal, well, it's not anecdotal, but it's a small piece of information, is uh, public opinion towards uh, uh, climate change. This is a poll taken in mid-April. So we were in the midst of the, the pandemic. And it shows uh, in green the percentage of Americans who think global warming is really happening. And uh, you can see that seven out of 10 think that it's, it's, it's real. And the this, this same polls uh, showed strong support for some type of, of action. So I think even when the pandemic, uh, when we get a, a better control of it, the uh, concern and demand for action on climate, at least in some sectors, is going to remain. So I don't have any uh, grandiose insights or uh, predictions because I don't really know what's gonna happen uh, in the wake of the pandemic. But a couple of things just to reiterate that are, are very important. One is preparedness. And uh, this is a challenge, uh, a big challenge because for a number of reasons. One is that humans have very high discount rates. We were programmed millions of years ago to run away from saber toothed tigers, not to respond to parts per million of some invisible gas that accumulates over centuries. And so uh, we tend to weigh the, the present over, uh, over future generations. Um, and uh, in the US, we have this strong cultural and political and economic uh, ethic of favoring the individual over the collective. And that has certainly been exacerbated uh, in recent years in the US. So those are challenges to the importance of being uh, prepared. A second uh, point of emphasis is that clean energy and energy efficiency have multiple benefits. A dollar invested in clean energy and energy efficiency generates more jobs than fossil fuels. That has been clearly demonstrated over and over again over the last uh, 20 years. There are health benefits. There are economic benefits, reduce utility bills, which disproportionately accrue to socially vulnerable populations. And that speaks to the, the equity issue, which uh, I emphasize needs to be really uh, discussed, need to be needs to be thoughtfully and intentionally included at the outset of any of this planning, because if you don't do that, by definition, it's gonna be excluded and the equity issue will become, uh, become even worse. And as I said, sustainability is not just a technical and economic and environmental challenge, it's ultimately one about uh, equity as well, because uh, the other uh, facets of sustainability stand on uh, equity as well. So with that, I'll uh, stop and turn things back to uh, either Nina or Camille or uh, whoever else is gonna take it from here. Great, thank you so much, Cutler. That was fantastic. And um, let me just, all right, here we go <laughs> again. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Cutler. That was really great. Um, I think that, you know, perfectly encapsulates how um, how interdisciplinary these issues really are, because it goes everywhere from the science and technology, which I think we're going to hear a little bit more about now, to policy, to economics, um, and in particular, I think so important to address the uh, issues of inequality that emerge and are you know, really in stark relief whenever there's a crisis. Um, so it's fantastic. And we'll get to more of that during the questions. Um, but 
in the interest of time, let me just introduce our next speaker, um, Stephen Greenbaum. He is a distinguished professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Hunter College. Um, he received his PhD uh, from Brown University, where I also received my PhD, um, did a postdoc at the US Naval Research Lab, was a Fulbright Scholar at the Weizmann Institute, and a NASA Senior Research Fellow at Caltech before joining CUNY. And today he's going to be talking about the challenges and opportunities around energy storage. Thank you very much, Nina. It's, it's also, it's, it's a real honor for me to follow uh, uh, Dr. Cleveland's uh, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so let me see if I can share my screen. Yeah, let me see if I can okay. unshare my screen. <laughs> seems to be a problem. Oops. Okay. All right, looks like I'm up. Great. Okay, anyway, it's a, it's a great opportunity for me to address uh, this group, uh, though remotely. Um, let me begin by <coughs> acknowledging the various funding agencies um, uh, that have uh, provided support uh, and my uh, <coughs> uh, fortunate uh, collaboration with uh, uh, company just outside of Boston. We've already heard a lot about Boston, uh, Ionic Materials, and let's highlight some of the work we've done with them. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, here's uh, the photo, recent photo of the people that actually do the work, my, uh, my group, my magnetic resonance group at Hunter College. Um, and uh, let me just also mention that there are a variety of other um, uh, colleagues at, at CUNY that do research in battery material, battery materials. So I've listed them here. If I've left somebody out, uh, please forgive me. Uh, so let me also uh, mention some quotes from people that uh, we've heard of, like Bill Gates, for example. Um, so this is actually a, a, a small segment of what uh, a previous uh, keynote speaker talked about, uh, and that's energy storage. And all the batteries on Earth that we have now can only store about 10 minutes of the world's electricity. Needs. So we need a real big breakthrough in order to enable uh, renewable energy, for example, which is intermittent. Um, John Doerr is the uh, head of the largest venture capital firm, among the largest in Silicon Valley, uh, who believes batteries are important. Of course, the MIT Tech Review, very succinctly, a better battery could change everything. So um, since I've only got 15 minutes of fame here, I'm only going to talk about one aspect, uh, which is electric cars. Okay, so let's look at this from an economic and business opportunity. So why is the electric vehicle market worth pursuing? So let's look at, uh, let me just also mention that uh, all major automobile manufacturers have a, have a, on a roadmap for us that, in which they're gonna stop manufacturing internal combustion engines in, in a period of years, not decades. Okay, so eventually all cars will be electric. That's, that's the roadmap. And if you look at the number of new car sales per year, this is worldwide about 88 million. Of course, these are pre-COVID figures. Uh, they're a little bit down now. Uh, and if every vehicle in the world were electric, you'd have uh, 1.2 billion. Okay, so um, looking at units of batteries, uh, about 10 ampere hours. Uh, so for a 50 kilowatt hour pack, battery pack, which would be the average size for electric car, you need 1,300 of these. You multi do the multiplication and you have this enormous number of 10 amp hour cells that we need in the world. Uh, if all the vehicles were electric, then we'd have one and a half trillion. Of course, numbers like trillion don't scare us anymore. We hear a lot about that. Um, but let's look at the, let's look at the economics. Uh, about $100 per kilowatt hour is considered the uh, economics break even point for uh, uh, where it's really more profitable to have electric cars. And then you have 50 kilowatt hours per vehicle. The batteries would cost about $6 trillion. Right. That's larger than the uh, GDP of every country outside of the U.S. and China. Of course, our GDP is going to be down a little bit this, this year, we expect. So it certainly it makes sense that uh, this is an economic opportunity. All right, well, here are the challenges. Um, range, you know, can, can we drive 300 miles or so before, before charging? The charging time, how long does, does it take to charge your battery? Uh, we're kind of spoiled because we, we, we uh, pull up to the gas tank, to the uh, gas station, and in three minutes, we're full. It's not so easy to do with electricity. Uh, we don't have an infrastructure yet for, uh, you know, for charging stations uh, at convenient locations. 
Safety is a big one. Okay, you all remember the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 a couple of years ago. You couldn't even drive to the airport if you had one of these with you. Uh, maybe you remember these uh, hoverboards not allowed signs in New York City buses, right? those on, on uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, this picture is not a gasoline fire, it's a battery fire. Okay, so so the, the, uh, we scale these uh, problems up from uh, cell phone to, to electric cars, the, uh, uh, the safety problems multiply accordingly. What about airplanes? Uh, you may remember that um, several years ago, uh, the entire fleet of Boeing 787 Dreamliners was grounded because the lithium iron battery in the uh, auxiliary power unit caught fire. Fortunately, this happened a couple of times only on the ground, okay? But basically, they had to uh, have a hiatus until they figured out what to do about that. So here's, here's the basic schematic of a lithium ion battery. Uh, you've got these, uh, it's, the reason it's called lithium ion because there's no free metallic lithium. You have these insertion electrodes, graphite on the left and a transition metal oxide on the right. And lithium ions go back and forth as you charge and discharge the battery. And to make the ions movable or mobile inside between these electrodes, you need electrolytes. Uh, the electrolyte is now an organic solvent. Uh, you have a lithium salt dissolved in organic solvent. This particular organic solvent is flammable. If you have a thermal event like a short circuit, you've got fuel uh, to create that fire that I just showed, right? Uh, in fact, the uh, organic carbonate um, uh, um, electrolyte solvent is about as flammable as kerosene, right? So there are other battery chemistries, just let me mention, uh, in competition, there's lithium metal, uh, which I'll say more about, lithium sulfur, sodium, various uh, other ions, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, and so forth, the so-called redox flow battery but I'm gonna focus on lithium from now on. So uh, there's been, a, you, you may remember that the 2019 Chemistry Nobel Prize was given for the development, invention and development of the lithium, lithium based battery, particularly lithium ion battery. But for the last 25 years, there's really been no movement on the electrolyte. Right? We're still basically using the same electrolyte with about 25 years worth of tweaking. Right? And the electric, again, this, this is almost as flammable as kerosene. You have got a mixture of these liquid carbonates um, and you have some kind of lithium salt in there that you need a source of ions. So here's some of the uh, research directions that people are taking. Uh, various, uh, in, in terms of liquid electrolytes, people are looking at fluorinated carbonates, which are a little bit less flammable, but, but uh, they're very expensive now. Even aqueous based chemistries, but the voltage is limited in that. And people are also looking at new salts to replace the, um, uh, the LIPF6 with other kinds of uh, lithium salts. Then you have a push to look, make, develop solid electrolytes, uh, which, which are not flammable, such as these ceramics and glasses. Um, and uh, what, I, what, what my interest has been is in developing solid polymer electrolytes, because polymer is very easy to process and, and make large format uh, films that can be incorporated into battery production units. So, uh, the ARPA-E is, is a branch of the Department of Energy that, that looks at high-risk, high-payoff projects. And um, Dr. Paul Albertus, who was heading one of the programs, came up with this really nice spider chart, spider web chart. It's really hard to make one material have all the properties that you need, right? So some of the, uh, was that my two-minute warning? I'm sorry, was that? I guess not, sorry. Um, uh, so. Uh, liquid electrolytes are good in some areas and, and, and uh, are very bad in other areas. The same thing for these glassy electrolytes like Lipon, the uh, sulfide compounds uh, like LGPS are good in some and very bad in other, very uh, wanting in other, other, other properties that you need to make an overall good electrolyte. So uh, our laboratory uses nuclear magnetic resonance as, as a primary uh, analytical tool. It turns out that nuclei that you can look at are very common battery materials. So this is kind of a happy coincidence. Um, uh, the NMR technique is very sensitive to small changes in local structure. It's quantitative. Um, we can look at uh, various peaks of, of the NMR spectrum and get an idea of, of the so-called phase diagram, the different phases that make up uh, the material that we're looking at. It's also very good for looking at dynamics. Uh, in a, if you're looking at new electrons, Electrolytes, you want to understand how the ions move and how well they move. Uh, so NMR turns out to be a very uh, useful technique to characterize that. We use a technique, a fairly standard technique called pulse field gradient diffusion. Um, so I, I won't bore you with the details, especially since I don't have much time. Um, but 
uh, the, using these various radio frequency pulses and, and non-uniform magnetic fields, we can get a signal that decays as a function of time. And the only fitting parameter to fit this decay is this so-called self-diffusion coefficient of the ion that we're looking at, the nucleus. And this is, what, this is very closely related to how well the ions move inside of the material. We use another technique called fast field cycling magnetic resonance. This is not a standard NMR system. This is, uh, most NMR is done at a fixed magnetic field, very high field. Here we have the means to vary the field from reasonably high to very low levels. And the, the, uh, we watch how the nuclear spins relaxed back to thermal equilibrium. And they, we can do that at a very low field. We can vary this field. The net effect being that we can cover four or five decades of frequency of dynamic range with a single experiment. Usually to cover this range of experiments, you have to do a bunch of exotic different NMR experiments. So these are the two techniques we use. Um, so let me just move to the, uh, most of the polymer electrolyte research is on polyethylene oxide, PEO, right? It's a very interesting material. It's been studied for almost 50 years. Uh, basically you have this amorphous and crystalline mix of materials. The ion transport, the ions can only move in the amorphous phase and only above this temperature called the glass transition temperature and only above the temperature where the crystalline phase is melted. The net effect is that these are great electrolytes but only above 80 degrees C. So that obviously eliminates a lot of applications. My colleagues in, in uh, Woburn, Massachusetts, um, just north of Boston, have developed a new polymer electrolyte based on a thermoplastic um, it's a crystalline polymer, uh, either polyether ether ketone or polyphenol sulfide. And uh, by adding a strong electron acceptor and lithium salt, they've created a new mechanism where basically the, uh, the, you have these defects in the polymer that attract preferentially the anion that leaves lithium ions relatively free to move. Okay, so there's no attempt to reduce the crystalline phase. We have these anion trapping sites. And these are very easy to process. We can make these films as thin as 20 microns. Right, right, right now we're down to 30. And we have a new transport mechanism. The motion of the ions is now decoupled from the host material, unlike in the polyethylene oxide, where the, the polymer chains and segments have to be moving for the ions to move. Also, uh, I'll, we have something called a high transfer number, which I'll illustrate in just a moment. So here's the NMR diffusion result. Um, here we have uh, two kinds of lithium salts, and the, star, the stars are the anions, the fluorine-containing the fluorine anions. The circles are the lithium ions. Notice that polyethylene oxide is all the way down here. In fact, in PEO, it's the counter ion, the anion, that moves faster than the lithium, which you really don't want. You want in a lithium-based battery, you want the lithium ions to be carrying most of the current. Here you have the, the counter ion actually carries most of the current, as, as in the star over here. Here, the lithium carries at least half the current, okay, as, as we've indicated over here. Furthermore, um, by this so-called Nernst-Einstein equation, we can actually estimate the ionic conductivity, which, one, which we measure directly, but we estimate it and we find that if you plug in the diffusion coefficients that we measure uh, to this equation, we get about the same result that you measure. And that's very crucial because that tells us that the salt that we put in in this solid polymer is basically dissociated. The ions are free to move. Um, just to show that the company has made a lot of progress the last several years, we're now this up to the so-called uh, Revolution 5, uh, where we actually have something like nine millisiemens per centimeter in conductivity at room temperature. Right? These are some of the previous um, versions of the material. Uh, and this is PEO, polyethylene oxide, all the way down here. So in fact, the lowest temperature at which you can measure reasonable conductivity is about, it's about 60 degrees. And at that temperature, the polymer that my colleagues have developed is about a factor of 50 higher. And so we're very excited about that. Um, just to show you that uh, this, you, you've got to have more than ionic conductivity. This is a lithium metal, not a lithium ion, lithium metal um, battery made with uh, lithium cobalt oxide. And it was charged uh, in June 2017. And a year and a half later, it retains 91% of its capacity after 18 months. And that, that's um, as, as good or better than the best commercial lithium ion battery. So there's really no, uh, there's, there's no self, appreciable self discharge. So this thing has an excellent shelf life, uh, stability at, 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 at above four volts. Uh, and also uh, if you push it really hard, now if you, if you wanna charge your battery fast or if you wanna accelerate 
you have to have a pretty high current density. And this is a, again, a, a similar battery, lithium metal, not lithium iron, uh, with a, uh, a cathode made with uh, nickel, it's a so-called nickel manganese cobalt cathode. Uh, and if you push it really hard, that's this curve down here, which you can get, still get appreciable power out of it, uh, we can sustain a current density of almost six milliamps per square centimeter. Um, if you're a battery person, that means a lot because this is a factor of 10, or almost about a factor of 10 higher than is, has ever been demonstrated with any other solid electrolytes. So, however, car companies aren't ready for lithium metal. So we've got to go back to lithium ion. And here's, again, where the advantage of a polymer electrolyte, a solid polymer electrolyte, is strongly uh, evident. So in a... Uh, so these are the so-called cathode particles, for example, the transition metal oxide. These are the anode particles. You have to electrically wire these things to the battery. So you have to have a pathway for the ions to get in and out. So you actually have a mixture of your electrolyte with your electrodes. And in a, a regular lithium ion battery, you have the same liquid electrolyte that soaks through the entire thing. Uh, and with the polymer though, you can actually tailor the composition to be more compatible with the cathode side more compatible with the anode side, and then also and have a third composition in between where the ions have to pass between these two. So you have that capability with a polymer electrolyte that you don't have with a liquid. So uh, just to show that my colleagues have demonstrated the so-called 10 ampere hour cell, these are actually higher, slightly higher capacity. Uh, they're, they're not a lithium battery company, they are a materials company. They, we've partnered with battery companies, one called A123 Systems, um, and uh, they've actually made the batteries out of our materials. Um, so with the near-term challenges, we want, we want to get the thickness down to even lower, about 15 microns without pinholes. We want to get even higher current densities. And uh, we're about 800 cycles. We want to get above 1,000 cycles under practical performance criteria, meaning high current densities and high capacities. We're further optimizing the uh, uh, formulations for use for the cathode and the anode. And uh, this is big, scaling up, right? Um, Originally scheduled for this March, uh, uh, for the previous March, now obviously rescheduled for the fall. Uh, we also believe the polymer platform is, will enable new horizons like lithium sulfur or even rechargeable alkaline. So let me summarize. Um, my colleagues have uh, invented an electrochemically stable polymer electrolyte. Uh, we've, all, we've shown that the, the ionic conduction mechanism is novel, right? Um, and uh, we're trying to do some science on that using NMR. Uh, we have is a record nine millisiemens per centimeter. Uh, this is about, this is actually higher than the liquid electrolyte that's, that's in use right now. Uh, and for my part, uh, the, uh, with NMR, this is the highest lithium uh, room temperature diffusivity ever recorded in solid material. So we're very excited about that. We can't wait to publish it, but we're still being restricted for uh, uh, basically IP reasons. Um, we've demonstrated safe operation of lithium metal, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, uh, uh, nickel uh, manganese oxide and also pouch cells, lithium ion pouch cells, uh, which we're sharing with our automotive partners in this. Uh, we hope to be able to resume uh, with the reopening of, of the facility, uh, scaling up to 50 amp hour cells, and uh, uh, we hope to have that done with our battery partner uh, in early 2020. And of course, from my point of view, uh, at, back in, at my laboratory, we, we look forward to using NMR to better understand the ionic transport mechanism. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to the Q&A. Great, thank you so much. That was great um, and just really highlights the challenge of um, trying to optimize safety, efficiency, cost, um, all while doing very high-end science. That's really great. Uh, our next speaker, is uh, Yolanda Small. She's an associate professor of chemistry at York College. Um, she is also an uh, incoming uh, executive officer for the graduate program in chemistry, I believe. Uh, she received her PhD in theoretical and computational chemistry from Penn State and was a research associate at Brookhaven National Lab before coming to CUNY in uh, 2010. She'll talk to us today about designing novel photocatalytic nanoparticle clusters uh, that may have applications in renewable energy. Ah, thank you, Nina, for organizing. Uh, let me project my slides here a second. Yes, okay. 
Okay, so thanks for the uh, introduction and um, I thanks for Steve for uh, giving us some background slides for the stuff that I'm going to be talking about this area of materials design using um, let me move one more thing out of the way. Okay, using uh, silver nanocluster fluorescence enabled by DNA. So, um, so the first thing I, I want to talk about is that for any material system, we'd like to have, you know, to build it, we want to use a brick and mortar. And so in our case, the brick and mortar for our system is DNA. And what's nice about DNA, it has all these, uh, well, uh, it's an inherently ordered structure. Um, it's great for self-assembly. Um, and what's nice is that um, in, to piggyback off of what Steve talked about, it has uh, charge transport properties that we're specifically interested in. Um, we want to know how the electrons and holes are moving. And so what's nice about DNA is that it has this, this uh, backbone of phosphates and sugars and, you know, they're neg negatively charged groups on the phosphates. And then it has these other materials like the base pairs where uh, attached to the sugars, you have these four base pairs, guanine, cytosine, uh, which normally attach to each other when they, they meet because of the chemical bonding and then adenine and thymine, which also attach to each other because of the chemical bonding. And so um, DNA itself has been studied um, for its charge transport properties by many people. And then there's ongoing debate for you know, several uh, decades now about how well the transport properties work in DNA. Um, when you have excited state molecules in the presence of DNA, it's been shown to uh, quench the fluorescence. And in our situation, if you put excited molecules in the presence of DNA, you can enhance fluorescence. And so we want to make uh, DNA work like these molecular conductors in our system. And we basically uh, are able to control uh, a lot of parameters of our system because of this well-ordered uh, DNA. Um, what we're interested in are nanoclusters per se. And the way you can protect nanoclusters are uh, multifold. In our situation, we're using DNA, but there are others who have protected these nanoclusters um, in various ways. And you can use things like, um, ah, okay. So you can use uh, dendritic materials, for example, or you can have, um, uh, I skipped a slide, did I? Ah, I did, sorry. Okay, so the uses of DNA in material science. So um, because of its self-assembly properties, we can basically use it to uh, form nice lattice structures. You can build drug delivery nanoboxes. You can create these three-dimensional shapes with DNA. And so they, you can attach different side groups to it. And it's a, so it becomes this very nice um, system that has a lot of manipulatable parameters. And so uh, from the point of view of biosensors, which is what we're interested in, you basically have two ways in which to uh, organize um, a DNA system. You can do that statically by attaching different sticky ends to the DNA, or you can do it dynamically by exploiting the melting properties of DNA. And in some of our studies, we look at melting temperature studies of DNA in complex with nanoclusters to uh, understand how those changes are made and, and where the transport properties are affected. So um, you can modulate the thermoelectrical and optical properties of, of silver nanoclusters um, by using different uh, arenas in, of DNA. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, so DNA isn't the only, only scaffolding material around nanoclusters. You can also have, um, as shown here, uh, different kinds of, of scaffolding materials. And it'll all depend on what wavelength range you're interested in. Um, for our systems, we're interested in um, the visible region, so 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, but you can also uh, work in other regimes based on what you use as your scaffolding agent. So you can have these dendritic materials that have uh, abilities to operate um, across UV and vis. Um, you can have these mercapto, uh, undeco, canonic, ionic acid um, for uh, smaller ranges uh, within the visible spectrum. You can have uh, dihydrolipopoic acid 
as capping agents and that will narrow again your range of operation and then you can have like bovine sobomamamin or uh, other uh, uh, protein systems as your capping agents. And so all of this does is help you to tune the range that you want to operate in based on the incoming light that you're plan planning to use for the application. Okay, so uh, there are several functions of silver nanoclusters or metal nanoclusters in general, and uh, the functions can be controlled. Um, uh, it, you can control it to locate specific target sites, and it gives you some flexible tuning capability. So these metal nanoclusters have el discrete electronic states. And those discrete electronic states in complex with their scaffolding agent, for example, like DNA, you can control the movement of electrons. So the uh, size of the metal uh, nanocluster um, will dictate where it fluoresces. And so some attractive features um, of metal nanoclusters is that they're ultra small. They're uh, less than two nanometers in size and they have good biocapability, biocompatibility because um, they, uh, you can basically connect them to several scaffolding agents and basically funnel them into the cell to, like uh, with uh, aptamers or other uh, carrier agents. They're excellently photostable. They have longer fluorescent lifetimes than, for example, uh, organic chromophores. And so they create, they're these great labeling agents. And so uh, with all of those options and parameters, there are a host of challenges that have come about with these systems that uh, we um, attempt to explore. Okay. Um, Another feature from these systems is that they're tunable. So if you can select a specific ligand, you can control where it absorbs and where it emits. And that um, uh, changes based on the size of the cluster that you build and how stable it stays uh, in that size and that structure. And so you can control the uh, emission intensity. And what's nice about this is that, for example, if you can consider an application like tumor paint, where um, it's a tool used in, in cancer surgery. It's an organic chromophore, and a surgeon would inject that into the uh, uh, cells of cancerous tissue where there's a selective marker for those cancer cells. And then you shine light on it, and you're able to basically see just the, the, the selective marker that it's attached to. And that stays uh, lit for on the order of uh, seconds. And so, what when it emits, it emits at a tunable wavelength. So you can basically control whether you want it to be a red emitter or a blue emitter or anything in between. And so um, this nice feature is uh, another uh, point of exploration that we're doing in our lab to try to understand how does this, uh, how does the DNA uh, enable the cluster to be tuned at, at those particular wavelengths. Okay. So, uh, the size is very important in the system. Um, uh, if you start with, you know, a single atom, uh, you scale up a single atom, you go to a molecule, multiple atoms together, a cluster, and then in the bulk. Now, what we're interested in is this cluster uh, here in that it's this nice harmony between uh, bulk properties and uh, atomic properties. And so it's the size of the cluster basically being this like less than two nanometers, it's compatible with the Fermi wavelength of electrons. And so that's the missing link between your single atom, uh, single metal atoms and the plasmonic uh, metal nanomaterials that are much larger than these clusters that we're interested in. So these metal nanoclusters interact with light and they display this absorption and uh, admission properties via electronic transitions like organic molecules. And so myself as a theoretical chemist, um, I like to do uh, uh, model systems of these kinds of clusters in silico to understand the uh, electronic states of the system, what properties are impacted by um, DNA being attached to it. And so, um, again, these are compared to organic chromophores, but they're much more stable, they have much more stable fluorescent lifetimes than the organic chromophores. 
Um, so what happens uh, in, in complex with uh, the DNA is that these clusters, so and this slide is an example of clusters of uh, the same number of atoms, but different geometries. And so DNA being what it is, if you can tune the sequence of DNA and the length of DNA, you can actually also tune the shape and orientation of the clusters. And so these, as you can see, will have uh, different uh, density of electronic states, uh, the different geometries are going to be modified by the DNA that's around it, and we're basically optimizing parameters of DNA like its uh, unique secondary structure, the number of CG pairs versus AT pairs because the positively charged holes will attach more to CG pairs than they do to AT pairs, and so you basically can tune the electronic um, system and understand like why you will get f uh, emission from these clusters in different places just by tuning the, uh, the DNA sequence. So the problem comes with a number of challenges like as has been described by uh, many of the other speakers in this webinar and that uh, because of these systems are extremely small, less than two nanometers, it's hard to basically understand what they look like uh, structurally. And so the first is the structural challenge. Um, uh, optical spectroscopy is available, but it doesn't tell us exactly what the structure looks like. So it's hard to determine the size of such a flexible system, and there are no good imaging techniques that are available. Um, in our lab, we have tried um, to, to use uh, AFM technology. Um, we're currently working on transition electron microscopy technology, and we've done some mass spec at the ISRC to try to nail down what this structure looks like, because that would be the beginning of a nice model to understand the electronic uh, um, parameters that govern uh, what you see uh, from the fluorescent spectroscopy. So some challenges, um, uh, here are some, uh, uh, sorry, some uh, STM uh, studies and TEM studies of, uh, for example, gold and silver nanoparticles. And so um, these are nice clear images of what's going on, but when we've done AFM and TEM on our system, they, they're uh, much more uh, murky because once the DNA is scaffolded to uh, the cluster, it's hard to distinguish where, where the DNA ends and the, the cluster itself begins. And in that small size regime, um, it's uncertain. And so we've tried to do um, AFM and TEM um, in solution phase. And so uh, the DNA is very mobile, and so it's hard to nail down. So what's been bugging this uh, area of research for quite a while is the mobility of the system in concert with the limitation in technology. But what's coming to the forefront is um, a new cryo uh, TEM, which will enable us to uh, um, basically freeze our system in, in some transitive state to try to understand structurally what's happening. So the interdisciplinary nature of our uh, of this work, um, it involves quantum mechanics and organic chemistry, biochemistry, and material science, and so it brings together basically a lot of the uh, power arms of the ASRC to be able to understand uh, what's going on. And we've optimized a lot of the uh, the capabilities at the center to understand our system. Um, what's nice about this is that uh, synthesizing these DNA silver nanoclusters are very cost effective compared to uh, other synthesis. And so uh, if you choose your uh, sequence of DNA um, length and uh, base pair arrangement, um, it's very easy to do. So you get these DNA silver nanoclusters are made just by reducing silver ions in the presence of uh, single-stranded DNA in a buffered solution. So it turns out that the charge carriers can tunnel very quickly through uh, adenine and thymine pairs, but that rate of tunneling decreases the longer the strand is. And that's uh, basically anything above four single-stranded base pairs. It also turns out that the charge carriers can thermally hop from one CG pair to another and is better for longer strands. And so the sequence chosen is then heavy loaded with a bunch of CG pairs um, so these are the best whole uh, charge uh, transfer uh, carriers. Um, longer strands are, however, important to us because it facilitates the formation of those well-ordered silver nanoclusters that I mentioned on the previous slide. So we're looking mostly for very ordered structures of this, this nature. And so the longer strands enable that the longer structure. 
And so the charge transport is due to the base pair sequence, the length, the properties of the buffer solution. And so DNA can be uh, seen as wiring for molecular electronic, molecular e electronics in this situation. Okay. So what we've done so far, we've characterized the system um, with uh, XAFs, um, uh, it's a fine angle scattering at the synchrotron light source at Brookhaven. And we've done electrospheronization mass spec uh, work at the ASRC. And we've basically able to characterize what size cluster we have, um, the charge state, but it doesn't give us any information about the secondary structure about DNA. And so we're hoping um, that our next phase of work will uh, we'll reveal that and we actually have, when the, the labs open back up, we can actually finish that up. So the next phase of work basically involves using uh, cryo electron uh, microscopy. And so this technology is uh, one of the latest uh, cryo TEM instruments at, at the Center for Functional Nanomaterials at Brookhaven Lab, where we're able to basically freeze our, our system in a, a layer of amorphous ice and basically kind of try to structurally characterize what's going on. Um, in the long run, uh, we're, we're hoping, sorry, we're hoping to use um, quantum mechanical, molecular mechanical uh, simulations to understand that harmony between the nanocluster itself and uh, the DNA around it. And so QMMM is um, um, a tool that enables us to be able to treat the cluster itself with quantum mechanics and look at those uh, energy states, the density of states, and then the DNA and its secondary structure are, 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 are treated with a force field with molecular mechanics around it. And uh, so in the interest of time, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, Dimitro and Nikki Pantruk at the Center for Functional Nanomaterials, um, some of the students I've worked with, uh, Valentina, Hong, and Tatiana, and my research technician, Paulina. Um, the uh, AFM work um, is done at Brookhaven at the Center for Fun Functional Nanomaterials. Um, the mass spec work is done at the ASRC. The XAFS work is done at the Synchrotron Light Source at Brookhaven. And this work is funded by the National Institutes of Health. And I thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Yolanda. That was excellent. And uh, I'm glad to hear that the uh, ASRC's core facilities have helped with your research and certainly would love to chat with you offline about how there may be more opportunities to do that. Um, our next speaker, Igor Kuskovsky, a professor in the Department of Physics at Queens College and the uh, current executive officer for the physics graduate program at the Graduate Center. He received his PhD in applied physics from Columbia. And today he's gonna to be talking to us about how to improve solar cells using quantum dots. Igor. Let me share the screen. <clears throat> so I hope you can see my screen. So um, my talk today about uh, towards third generation photovoltaics and how we uh, would like to improve solar efficiency using submonolayer quantum dots. Um, first, I'd like to point out that this work uh, came out from uh, our previous fundamental studies. And uh, uh, just to remind everyone that there is a very short jump sometimes from fundamental physics to material science and uh, real apply, uh, applications. And um, uh, as the previous talk, uh, talk showed that that's very important for us. Uh, so, uh, the work was funded over the years from National Science Foundation, currently Department of Energy, and we have a small seed grant from Advanced Science Research Center right now to actually make it devices, and I'll talk about that. So, this is our current interdisciplinary team, and it's a CUNY team. It's across uh, three different campuses. Um, and uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Dr. Dej, Cassandra Mirata, and Gekhan Rinapura from Queens College, who helped us earlier in the work to uh, do certain calculations which we used um, uh, to fabricate the devices. So to start, let me show you the current map of the United States, and it fits to our uh, first talk, that right now the 14 states which plan to have fully renewable energy by uh, 2050. 
Uh, and I know the mayor of uh, Boston will be gone by 2050, but I think in terms of science and advances, and we saw that before, it's not that uh, long time. So, and a couple of headlines as well, which has just came out in the last two weeks, and you can see that renewable energy now eclipses uh, coal, the new, new installations. And uh, even in current administration, um, uh, does approve some of the solar projects, and um, um, that's that's quite important. So uh, the next graph shows you what are current efficiencies of um, photovoltaic installations um, available right now in the country. So what's important that uh, the most efficiencies right now in this circle, you can see it's around 20-25%. And that's actually very small if you want to reduce the footprint of the solar cells, especially on the uh, utility level, because uh, the, the solar installations take a lot of room. So most of these devices are made of so-called single junction solar cells. So let me go quickly, what is the single junction solar cell? It, schematically, the physics diagram is shown here, but for all practical purposes, you have to think about this is that it's a, it's a, solar, uh, it's a solid state device on which we illuminate with, um, with sun and it's produced the current. So when you illuminate this device with sun, you create the current which shown on this red line. And there are three important um, parameters here. One is the open circuit voltage, uh, short circuit current, and the ratio of this yellow box to the total area under the red curve which basically defines so-called fill factor. And these three parameters are controlling the efficiency of the solar cell. So what are the efficiencies of the solar cells? Going back to 1961, uh, it was theoretically shown, if you take the best theoretically available material for you, for you and look and apply physics to this material, and to this single pin junction solar cell, you will not get more than 30% efficiency. Now, a little bit better calculation shows that you can get 33% efficiency. And under full solar concentration, close to 41. So for, uh, full solar concentration is when you take the optics and focus sun on a small area of solar cell. And a small sun is just when you have solar cell right uh, in the ambient. So that's why you can see that most of the modules we're using are about 25%, because practically we're already at the theoretical uh, efficiencies of the uh, materials. So next graph shows you the cost, and you had similar uh, graph previously on a much longer scale, but this shows you graph and the cost of photovoltaic uh, over the last decade. Yes, it's went down. However, in yellow, and especially on utility scale, you can see that the cost of the modules is about 50%. So if you want to decrease footprint of the solar installations, let's say uh, like nuclear energy was mentioned, um, the power density is much higher. So if you want to re introduce um, footprint of solar installation and uh, in decrease cost of photovoltaic further, you need to increase efficiency of the, uh, of the module. And increase efficiency of the modules is directly related to its material properties of design and improvements above single, uh, um, single junction solar cells. So these are so-called third generation photovoltaic. What is second one? I can re uh, answer the questions, uh, but uh, this is a, uh, the next step is the uh, third generation of photovoltaic. So what is third generation photovoltaic? Uh, there are three major uh, directions of this. One is the multi-junction solar cells, it's so-called tandem solar cells. Um, these are actually practical nowadays and they already um, installed in the field, mostly in uh, areas where the cost is not that critical. So under full solar concentration, the record is right now 47.1%. 
they are expensive and it's technically very difficult to do because of what so-called uh, current matching. So that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that right now. The second one is so-called multi-carrier generation in colloidal nanocrystals. And the attempt here is to produce multiple charge carriers from one photon. Basically from one unit of light, you can produce multiple electrons uh, and multiple holes, electron car carriers, and increase the photo current and increase efficiency. There is a difficulty how to collect these so-called hot electrons. So there is not much of advantages, uh, advances happened uh, over the recent years. The third step is so-called intermediate band gap solar cells. That's where um, we're thinking we can make a change. Uh, I have to tell you that it, these are, uh, a lot of people work on them, but they're still not uh, employed in real life as compared to tandem uh, and junction solar cells. The, the reasons are following. So first, let me explain. Uh, first, first, let me explain you what's the intermediate band solar cell. Uh, again, without going into details uh, of the physics, the idea is to take a single junction solar cell and put intermediate band, intermediate step for the charge for the electrons to be absorbed in the material. So, for all practical purposes, what it does is actually absorbs the light which is generally transmitted and lost when the normal solar cells operate. The same as a glass. When you look at the glass, that's why we see the light through the glass because it transmits visible light. So most of the solar cells employed right now transmit a lot of uh, light in the infrared part of the spectrum, uh, which is lost. Also, because in this uh, specific application, you can increase so-called band gap, so you can capture more of the light in UV part of the spectrum without losses to the heat. So uh, theoretically, you can reach under full solar concentration up to 63%, and these are shown the best parameters. Just remember these numbers, um, and uh, just two numbers, um, which will be important to understand why we do what we do. So the next step, why? We're using our sub monolayer um, uh, type two, uh, the sub monolayer 2.6 uh, quantum dust. Most of the intermediate band solar cell approaches, which work right now, and it's, it's actually skyrocketed in the last five or six years, if you look at the literature, used with the so called 3 5 systems. And if you look at this uh, diagram here, these work at relatively low band gap. This is the number on the y axis. So they work with about 1.3, 1.5 electron volts. As you remember, the requirements for the best intermediate band solar cells is close to two electron volts. And it turns out that our material system will work, which is shown here. And the specific uh, uh, parameters are shown in, in this graph are actually of the about close to two electron volts. The second important point is that the previous systems, the 135 system people work on, are grown by so-called stransky krasunov uh, methods. Again, without going into detail, it has two deficiencies, two major deficiencies. One is creating so-called waiting player, which results in a reduction of the open circuit voltage, and it results in escape of charge carriers, which reducing uh, a short circuit current. And the second one, it's very hard to grow very thick quantum dot layers by strong crossing of method. So that means technically you will reduce the possibility of the light absorption. And it turns out the quantum dots we work with, so-called submonolayer quantum dots, they're grown without waiting clear. And we can grow, and we successfully showed before that we can grow close to 200 layers, and it's probably we can grow thicker than once. So that's why we start looking in application of these quantum dots to fabricate successful uh, solar cell devices. So this is uh, uh, the image of uh, MBE system uh, at uh, City College where the, all the materials are grown. Uh, you can see it's fairly complicated and uh, um, but that's uh, what's needed to grow the, the modern devices if you think about it. So that's what uh, as our proposal of the device. This is a, a cartoon of schematic device where we have a P-type layer out of uh, zinc selenium telluride. Then we have quantum dot layer. Then we have N-type material and it's grown on a substrate. So this is for 
the, for the expert for physics, the, the schematic of the band diagram, you don't have to worry about that except to look at this uh, open circuit voltage calculation, which is close to one electron volt and would be important to see how our progress is. We actually can grow a P type layer and N type layer successfully, which is shown in this, uh, in, which shown in this table. And this is uh, an SEM image of a grown prefabricated device. You don't have a device, it's just the material which the device has to be made of. And the important part here is that the active layer was done out of the ternary quantum dots. And uh, we spend a lot of time working on the details, how to avoid that. So I'll show you only very recent results uh, where we actually change this approach from ternary quantum dots to binary quantum dots. So now we grow our material with uh, using binary quantum dots, in this case, the cadmium telluride. And for the, again, for the experts, you can see this is X-ray diffraction on uh, symmetric, so-called an asymmetric uh, configuration. And now uh, you can see be because of the availability observation, um, um, multiple super uh, lattice peaks, you see the quality of devices is high. Now we actually managed to grow now stream compensation structure which also reduces devices, uh, reduces uh, defects and improve the quality of the device. So how can we do that? That's the fabrication steps. They done it um, at ASRC. Without ASRC, we tried before we couldn't do that. So uh, that's the image of uh, final device. And if you think that's very simple for step, I just show quickly the flow diagram of actually what's that involved. It's really complicated. So here's a result uh, of our device and measurements. Uh, and I show this against the cartoon previously shown. So we actually managed to get uh, open circuit voltage close to 0.6 electron volts, which is very uh, decent compared to one electron volt theoretically. We get a uh, decent um, short circuit current. Uh, our fuel factor is slow. It's about 35%. Uh, the best silicon solar cells show about 80%. But considering that as a first device, I think we're doing pretty well. So the next step is a calculation of uh, so-called quantum efficiency. And uh, I would not look at the specific of the numbers because uh, a lot of efficiency depends on processing, the contacts and so on. But I'd like to point to this uh, above uh, 850 nanometer peak, which actually shows that device with quantum well actually can absorb longer wavelengths and that's why we think the efficiency is actually increasing. So in the final point is uh, that's the experimental setup, but can we actually detect the, uh, the intermediate band and actually how deep in the infrared we can go? Here's the result of um, measurement of observation of absorption in visible part of spectrum when we shine uh, infrared light at 15, 15 nanometers, which is below, much below, uh, that uh, absorption layer. And you can see that quantum dot sample, um, it's not the uh, greatest results. I have to say that the samples were grown about a week before shutdown. These measurements were done about two days before shutdown. Unfortunately, we lost, lost two months, but hope we can pick it up from that. So I think uh, we are on the way to fabricate uh, high efficiency intermediate solar um, then solar cells and contribute to increase of efficiency and promotion of photovoltaic. So let me summarize uh, that we believe that uh, there's our stacked type two cadmium selenizing, cadmium selenide multilayer subanalytic quantum dots can be used to form intermediate band solar cells. We get uh, 0.6 volts uh, open short circuit volt, uh, open, open circuit voltage uh, under high illumination and we have noticeable increase of quantum dot uh, effects under uh, infrared um, illumination. So what do we need to do next? First, we have to improve our contact and processing. Very simple step is annealing, which we'll do next. Uh, we have to improve our contacts. It has been shown that you need to use grid contacts rather than open contact for concentrated uh, photovoltaics. And uh, then in material structure, we'll go to the next uh, P-type layer, such as zinc, magnesium, telluride, to, inc to improve on open circuit voltage. And uh, we can uh, also increase beta photon management. Uh, and I'd like to mention that because if you 
uh, go and really look at what's happening in the photovoltaic field. Most of the advances right now, not on the material side, but rather on the photon management. Um, at this point, I will stop and thank you. Thank you, Igor, it's great. Let me just get back here and uh, say we are running a little bit behind on time, but um, we'll take a few minutes to take a, a couple questions. We've just enabled the chat. So if you have a question for any of the four speakers today, please go ahead and submit one into the chat. Um, I was wondering myself, um, basically how we could, um, this is less of a scientific question and more of a, an administrative question. Um, this was really wonderful to kind of bring together people who are thinking about things on the policy uh, and economic side and people who are working on the science and materials and engineering, uh, working with companies to get new technology out. How do we bring those communities together more so that the um, science that's being done, the advances that are being made are in line with what municipalities and governments and companies are looking for um, to make the most effect quickest, if anyone would like to speak towards that idea. I'll take a crack at it. Nina, this is Caller Great. speaking. I really enjoyed the presentations by Steve, Yolanda, and, and Igor, um, which really point to the, you know, as Charlie mentioned at the outset, the range of the scale of the challenges from very macro and human centered to very uh, micro and, and technical, and we need progress on all fronts. The connection to actually uh, develop the, getting these new technologies in, out in the field where they're actually gonna make a difference uh, really is a, a question of how markets, how well markets function and what the role of government policy is in speeding these, these transitions. And I think, you know, in my talk, I indicated uh, some important hinge points in uh, historic energy transitions where very deliberate focused policy interventions the examples were at the, the federal level, but there are other examples at the state level uh, as well, had very dramatic impacts. And so we, we really, these new technologies are rolling out and are gaining market share because they're, they're cheaper and better, they have lower emissions. But from a climate perspective, it's not happening fast enough. And so the market uh, for all the, it, it, markets are great at, at producing iPhones and, and trips to Disney World, they're not so great at dealing with uh, uh, social, broad social imperatives. And so I think we really need, uh, you know, active uh, informed government policy to accelerate these transitions. And unfortunately, we're not seeing that at the federal level in the US, but we are seeing it at the local and state levels. So cities and states are really leading. The most aggressive action is happening at, at those levels. And so uh, I think people you know, need to support and advocate for those changes uh, at those levels of government. Great, thanks for that. Also, um, Steve uh, put in the chat, I think another, um, another source of pressure can come from the investment community um, and they can really put a, put more money and emphasis um, and their brand even behind uh, making these changes happen much more quickly. Um, a question for Igor from Diana Strickland, who's uh, in the Photonics Initiative. Can you talk more uh, about what you meant on the summary slide by photon management? Yes, I mean, uh, we're not there, but we have to start thinking about that uh, from onset. So if you take a best solar cell, you still will have light reflection. Still not every photon unit of light will be absorbed. So a lot of work right now done in silicon solar cells, is especially that uh, you try to trap the light near the solar cell. So they put uh, anti-reflection coating, they change um, the bottom of the solar cell, make it rough. Uh, in our particular case, we're thinking to create wide band gap semiconductor with a low um, dielectric uh, refractive index to make light reflect back into solar cell. So to increase the absorption, yes, 
we can make the theoretically best of ourselves, or we're losing photons, just not from the material point of view, but from the basically um, light point of view. And if that's what I mean on the photon energy. I hope that answers the question. Great. Um, one more question, and then I think we're going to move into the breakout sessions for a few minutes. Um, Kendra, um, Kendra asked for Cutler, uh, have you been working with the Green New Deal folks on their plans for a just and equitable energy transition? If so, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, I have not been working directly with the Green New Deal folks. If, if by that you mean the architects uh, of the Green New Deal in, in Congress. We are working on uh, a project at, sit, at a city level right now um, a short run project funded by a couple of foundations that was pretty much along the lines of what I, I talked about. And that is what are the connections between COVID, climate change, city action, and, and how it's aimed at city climate and sustainability offers, uh, officers. And how can they advocate within city halls uh, continued investment and attention uh, in you know, meeting clean energy? Uh, targets that cities and communities have uh, developed. And it's brutal because budgets are being slashed and, uh, you know, it, it's a horrible time economically. It, and yet the climate change, the effects of climate change, which at an aggregate level are going to be way worse than COVID in terms of morbidity, mortality, <laughs> excuse me, remain. So this is a big challenge. So we're trying to put together uh, some some work that uh, gives them some some talking points and ammunition and guidance on how to make those arguments. And it includes, uh, I would say, a connection to the New Green Deal in two important ways. One is focused on economic recovery, how you can, how investments in clean energy and energy efficiency can uh, put people to work, and also on equity, that whether you're talking about adapting to sea level rise or uh, heat spells or wildfires or reducing emissions, equity has to be done in a very intentional uh, and transparent way. Excellent, thanks. Um, and then just finally, maybe um, Charlie, if you're still on the line, I can't actually see you. Yes, you're there, great. Um, wondering if you can kind of help bring some of this together and talk about maybe some of the ideas that have come up in terms of how we can move towards convergence research in this area. Um, and what kind of investment and um, modalities we might need. Okay, uh, that's a pretty broad question. Yeah, and I've given you like maybe a minute. A pretty, pretty <laughs> so okay. answer it all. Well, all right. I, think, I think ultimately what it's going to take is going to take all hands on deck. And so this was just a flavor that these four talks were a very interesting flavor of the way we really need to transcend the different disciplines and the different scales and also the different sectors. Um, there was some discussion in, in Cutler's uh, talk on you know, the need for environmental um, stewardship, okay? But I was actually a little bit surprised from the standpoint that Cutler, you didn't me mention very much about this notion of ecosystem or biospheric services. And both Cutler and I come from a pedigree of, uh, of uh, uh, our mentor, Charlie Hall, who himself was mentored by a guy named Howard Odom, who came up with this notion that the planet and its biogeophysical cycles and energy and water and ecosystems plays a very important and, and actually economically significant role in sustaining the planet. So one of the things that I think needs to be uh, pulled into this discussion uh, at the broadest scale is how the biosphere plays into all of this. How much uh, of these ecosystem services or public, uh, public subsidies that nature gives to us can be brought into the fold? So there's a lot of biology uh, in addition to the things that Yolanda uh, spoke about uh, that needs to come to the forefront. Uh, at the same time, I very much like Steve's intervention about getting the investment community uh, involved. There are as I understand it, literally trillions of dollars, uh, God knows now with the COVID uh, economic downturn, but there were at one point recently, trillions of dollars sitting in the wings, ready to be invested 
uh, for uh, sustainability. Uh, that is uh, environmentally and socially conscious individuals who are uh, willing to put their money into sustainability thinking and sustainability transitions. And in order for that to happen, you have to have good basic information, scientifically based information upon which these uh, investors can make sound decisions. And so the idea here is to uh, give them important critical metrics, science-based metrics upon which they can make their informed decisions along the lines of what Cutler was talking about, for example, with the, with the city of, of Boston. And it's not just the government, it's really the private sector that, that can be a real game changer here. So I hope I didn't go well over a minute. I'm no, you were, that was great, Charlie, thanks so much. And I'm gonna, I keep having questions. So I'm just gonna ask one more. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pick out Yolanda and I'm gonna take it down to the science and say, you're kind of at the intersection of physics and biology and chemistry and computation and theory and engineering and materials and, and all of those scientific disciplines that need to converge in this area. And I'm wondering from, from, where, from your experience and where you sit in your research, how do, you think, um, how do you think we can move forward to do more of that at CUNY in the next year or two or five or 10? <laughs> Well, oddly enough, I would have been able to answer that question before about two months ago. Right. <laughs> right now, it I'm may at be a, a loss. little different. I, mean, I have no access to any of the things that I used to. But thankfully, I'm a computational chemist, so I still have access virtually to clusters to run my calculations. But without the experiments, and that's kind of the important part of my work, it's a very tight coupling between experiment and theory. We can have one step in theory and then, you know, there's a, a completely different avenue that we see from an experiment that we need to include in our theory. And without that coupling, we're kind of missing a huge bit of the picture. And so um, I don't know how to answer that question in, in new times. Um, the labs <laughs> have been, um, they're specialized instruments. And so when you're on a, you know, a cryo TEM, there's only one person scheduled at a time. So that perhaps, perhaps with social distancing, we can actually make this work. I'm but counting it's, on it's, it. It's a new beast in trying to attract people and students and postdocs to continue to grow this field because unbelievably, this is not, it's an old problem. I started this problem when I joined CUNY, you know, 10 years ago. And it was, you know, I was 10 years late in the game. And 20 years later, we still have no resolution on how silver nanoclusters work. So it takes time and resources. And with short resources, given it being redirected to COVID, I have no idea how this will, will go. <laughs> And the answer Sorry is that my answer is more satisfying. You have to be <laughs> optimistic and yes. uh, um, and just uh, hope for the best in our future. Um, so we're nearing the end of our, our two hour time window. Those of you who can stick around, we're going to leave the session open and move into discussion groups. So there'll be four discussion groups, um, one for each of the speakers. And you can choose which one you'd like to join. There are some instructions for how to do this. There's a couple different ways. One is to hover over your um, bar, which is either at the top or at the bottom, where it says participants, click on that. Um, you'll find your name in the list and can click more and rename yourself. And we ask you to put one of the numbers in front of your name, and then we'll assign you to that discussion group. The other way to do it is if you have the, uh, the video open for yourself where you can see yourself, um, if you hover over that, there's little three dots you can click on and you can also rename yourself from there. So if everyone can take a moment to do that, then our behind the scene, scenes AV team will designate you and move you into a discussion group where you can continue the conversation with one of the speakers. Um, and then I will just say that I hope that you all will uh, join us after this for our next two um, webinars. Uh, and we'll look forward to sharing our findings and, and, um, and the thoughts and, and wonderful things that we learned about through these talks and through the discussion groups with you in July. Let's see how we're doing. Um, I would also just point out that there's going to be a note taker in each of the discussion groups.